Thank you, Takahiro, for introduction. And let me thank the organizers, or to be precise, the organizers other than me, other than myself, for everything, and especially Abhishek. Where is he? Yeah, thank you. So today I'm going to talk about uh, some a topic about quantum spin chain. So this is rather different than what Peter Raymond was talking about. Uh, and it's, it's called lipschitz mattis type theorem, but it's in the context of thermalization, it's, it's a bit related to something I would call a no non-degenerate scar theorem, but I will come to this later. And this is a rather mathematical work, and it's a joint work with Yoshiko Gata. She's a very good mathematician, and actually she's the main author of this work. And I searched the internet for Yoshiko, her picture, and only found this one. But you see a gentleman here, but he's not here. This is, this is Marcos, so Marcos is not here yet. Oh, so, but, so this is Yoshiko. Okay. So let me start with some introduction to this kind of statement. So by a leap schultz mattis type theorem, I mean a no-go theorem that says that certain quantum many-body system cannot have a gapped unique ground state. So a ground state is unique and there is a gap and bunch of excited state. And this kind of theorem says that this, this kind of situation cannot happen. So ground state may be gapless or ex, uh, exhibit symmetry breaking, whatever, but you know, it said that there cannot be unique gapped ground state. The original theorem goes back to 1961, proved by Lipschitz and Mattis, and it was about the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg chain with spin one half. It's one of the most, uh, one of the most basic quantum anybody system. And it was extended by Affleck and Leap to other spins. And, what, and this is a standard Hamiltonian. And what they say basically is that for any lowercase l, which is strictly larger than the system size, uh, you can find an energy eigenvalue which is larger than the ground state energy, but it's very close to the ground state energy. The difference is constant divided by this l. So if, if the system size l is large, then you can take this lowercase l also large, so you have very uh, energy eigenstate with very low excited energy. So let me tell you what, how do you prove, how do one, they prove this theorem? And the starting point is the observation that uh, this Hamiltonian has a unique ground state that comes from the perron frobenius theorem. And then uh, it must have the same invariance as the Hamiltonian. So in particular, it is rotationally invariant. So here's the operator which rotates the whole of the spins by uh, about the z-axis by angle theta, and you can show that this ground state stays the same. And, but th this is not this is not useful. Uh, what we use, what we do is this. So again, we make a rotation in spin space, but now the rotation angle here is not a constant. It starts from zero and gradually increases to two pi, and two pi is of course same, same as zero, so it stays there. It's, it's a kind of local gradual twist. So we gave this local gradual twist to the ground state and make this variational state. And you may guess that if this lowercase l is large, then this deformation to the ground state is very, to the state is very gentle, and uh, the energy increases only by a little bit. And yes, that is true, and you can easily show this variational estimate. The energy expectation value in this twisted state is only slightly higher than the ground state energy. So it looks like we are done. Uh, we have this estimate. But actually, to do the variational proof, we have to be careful. We have to be careful, we have to show that the ground state and this new variational state, twisted state, are orthogonal with each other. And interestingly enough, this orthogonality can be shown generally by using symmetry for only for half of the integer spins. So uh, this statement was proved for ha uh, Heisenberg antiferromagnetic chain with half of the integer spins. And there cannot be a unique gap ground state. So this is the original theorem. And there are many extensions, even for higher dimensions of this lipschitz mattis theorem, but all of these uh, extensions make use of this rotational invariance of the ground state in an essential manner. But rather recently, 
Peng Gu Wen and Watanabe published one as well too. Uh, these people found a new type of generalization. And uh, they argued that there are similar no-go statements for models without continuous symmetry, but with some discrete symmetry. And their argument is totally different. There's no, nothing like local twist. The argument is that the projective representation of the symmetry is inconsistent with the existence of a unique gap ground state. Well, I will explain this. And very interesting, so this kind of argument is related to all this topological condensed matter physics. And this appeared, this kind of idea appeared first in like 2009 in physics community. But uh, we found that back in 2001, mathematician Taku Matsui already had very similar argument. And he didn't apply to this in his situation. And so uh, a typical theorem that comes from this kind of new extension and a, tip, a theorem that we are going to prove rigorously here is, as, is like this. So you consider a quantum spin chain, one dimensional spin system with half of the integer spin and the short range Hamiltonian and which is invariant under translation and Z2 cross Z2 transformation. What is this? Well, it's just simple. It's, it's simply the rotation, pi rotation about the three orthogonal axes. So this, you can see that this Rx rotates spins about the, the, the x-axis, and this is a rotation about the y-axis. And actually, if you combine this and this, you get this one, which is a rotation about the z-axis. So this is a, a simple group, very simple abelian group called uh, Z2 cross Z2. So I assume that the Hamiltonian is invariant under this transformation, and so an uh, example is, this. I mean, there are many examples, and the Heisenberg anti Heisenberg model is an example, but uh, you can have these different coupling constants for each different direction, or you can have even this weird term. But I'm not saying that I'm going to study this seriously. This is, this is just an example. Okay, so I assume translation invariance and Z2 cross Z2 invariance. Then uh, the statement is that it can never be the case that the corresponding infinite volume ground state is unique and accompanied by a non-zero gap. So this is a no-go theorem. Well, um, there are many conditions, so I, I want to briefly, uh, quickly convince you that these conditions are really necessary. So first of all, uh, I assume Z2 cross Z2 invariance, and of course certain symmetry is necessary. For example, if you add this uniform magnetic field and break this Z2 cross Z2 invariance, then of course, uh, if, if H is very, very large, then you, you can forget about this, and the ground state is, of course, all upstate, and this is unique, and in order to excite this, you have to flip one of the spins, so you pay like two of H, and so two SH, uh, then, of course, there is a gap. Of course, certain symmetry is necessary, and I assume translation invariance, of course, that is necessary. This is a Heisenberg antiferromagnetic chain, but with bond alternation. So here you have weak bond and strong bond with theta, very good, big theta. And in this case, uh, if theta is very, very large, you can easily convince yourself that the ground state is written compactly like this. Uh, this is for the case of spin one half. This is a singlet pair formed, formed by two spin one halves. So for theta very, very large, this is, people call this dimerized ground state, uh, these two, make singlet pair of these two things. So strong, th this corresponds to strong bonds with theta greater than theta. So in this case, we have unique gapped ground state and for a trivial reason. So we need translation invariance. And uh, I try to exclude the possibility of a unique gapped ground state. And this is again necessary and this is very, there is a very interesting example by Majanda and Ghosh, I think, Professor Majando is a very famous professor. And uh, they solved, this is a Heisenberg antiferromagnetic chain with next nearest neighbor interaction. And they essentially solved this problem and showed that there are two gapped ground states with this dimerization. So in this case, yes, there can be gapped ground states, but uniqueness is violated. And finally, uh, here's, you know, I assume that spins must be half of the integer, but this is again essential because if spin is integer, then uh, there is something called Haldane phenomena, and it is known that the, this even this the simplest basic 
Heisenberg antifermionic chain has a unique gapped ground state. And actually, so Haldane got a Nobel Prize. He has it here, mainly for this thing. And you will notice that Duncan Haldane is holding his Nobel Prize very tightly so that this guy won't take it away. <laughs> okay. Right, so I convinced, I thought, I, I hope I convinced you that all these conditions are necessary. So the statement I'm going to prove is that you take a spin chain with half an integer spin, short range interaction, translation invariance, D2 cross D2 invariance, and then there can be no unique gapped ground state. Now, uh, before going on, I want to quickly review what the group C2 cross C2 is and what its representation and projective representation. But this is actually all of you basically know if you have gone through a quantum mechanics course. So Z2 cross Z2 is a very simple group which consists of four elements. E is the identity and the rest satisfy this rule. And as, as I briefly said, you mean this is most uh, typically realized in this three-dimensional box thing. And if you have, if you have three-dimensional thing, you can rotate this by pi about three axes to, to examine. You, you can experiment to see this, this is true. Okay, so now we are interested in, of course, spins. So uh, let me look at the D2 cross D2 transformation of quantum spins. And of course, the most basic is a single spin. So now I look at, I take a single spin, single quantum mechanical spin, which is described by this spin operator. So this S squared is S, S, S and this, this S is spin quantum number. And I consider the pi rotation about the alpha axis. And this is the pi rotation operator. And then uh, it's an easy exercise to show that these rotation operators satisfy this Z2 cross Z2 rule. That's, that's okay. And now there's difference between integer and half of integer S. First of all, if S is an integer, then we can still show that this squares, the square root of U is one, and this is more important, uh, different use commute with, the, with each other. So in this case, if you take the identity operator, U, 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 these three rotation operators, then uh, they form a representation, a standard representation of the group Z2 cross Z2. Okay, now, uh, but everybody you know, learned in quantum mechanics class that there is something strange about spin one half. If you take half of integer spin, like one half and so on, and the typical case spin one half, in the typical case of spin one half, actually these pi rotation operators are exactly given by the Pauli matrices. You only need to multiply by minus i. And in this case, uh, they first of all, the square is minus one. Uh, this is not very essential, but this one is essential. The different use anti-commute with each other. Of course, we know this from Pauli matrices. So in this case, uh, it's not a representation of Z2 cross Z2. There are these unwanted signs. And there is a notion called projective representation in mathematics. So these four operators sort of give representation of Z2 cross Z2, but with some extra unwanted signs. And in this case, uh, it is said that th they, give a, they form a projective representation, non-trivial projective representation of the group. And these two representations are essentially different, and that is very important. Okay, so I want to prove this Nogo theorem, but it's rather difficult, but I can show you the argument for a uh, limited class of states called matrix product states. And I think some of you are familiar with the notion of matrix product states, but not all of you. So let me give you a brief introduction. So this class of states was invented by Farnes Nachtergel Werner, sorry for the bad pronunciation, uh, in, back in 1989. And it's a quantum, uh, it's a state on quantum spin system on a chain uh, of length L. And this is a standard basis state, yes, SZ basis state. And then, this is something. For each spin index sigma that, can, that runs from minus S to S, you pick your favorite D by D matrix M sigma. So there are two S plus one matrices. You just pick. After picking your matrix, you write down this state. It's just a, it's just a very simple recipe. So 
This is just sum over all the possible basis states. And here's the basis state, so here's the coefficient. This coefficient made, is made up in a very peculiar way. You, you take the product of all these matrices, uh, which corresponds to this spin configuration, and then you take the trace. Then you get a complex number, and, and you, you use this as a coefficient. Well, then, at first, it look, uh, in the first time, it looks like just an arbitrary way of writing down a state for a quantum spin chain, but it is known that this is a rather, rather universal. And it is known that states with small entanglement can be approximated by MPS very well. So it's a very important class of states now. And also, among MPS, uh, this is a very important, there is an important class called uh, injective MPS. Uh, let me break it quickly. Uh, phi is said to be injective if this normalization condition is true, and if the product, uh, and, and if there exists a number L, and if the product of M matrices with all possible spin configurations span the whole space of D by D matrices. Rather heuristically speaking, uh, phi, a state can be, um, an MPS phi can be uh, represented as an injective MPS if it has small entanglement, aerial entanglement, and it's not a cat, it's not a Schrodinger's cat types. That is the base rough argument, and this is a rigorous definition. And then, no go theorem for the, uh, MPS reads simply like this. There cannot be a translation invariant and Z2 cross Z2 invariant injective MPS when spin is half of integer. That is the statement. And this statement was basically pro uh, proposed by Chen Gu Wen and proved in a certain way by Watanabe and others. And here's a proof which is uh, arranged by myself. Oh, let me show it quickly. Um, so, I assume that, okay, here's a translation invariant MPS. And I assume that this guy is injective and also Z2 cross Z2 invariant. Z2 cross Z2 invariant means that it's, it is invariant under the pi rotation about three axes. So this is a pi rotation operator and it stays the same. Now, I plug this in here and rewrite this invariance condition like this. How did I do this? Well, for the right-hand side, right-hand side, it's, it's just the same. For the left-hand side, I did a, just an undergraduate calculation. Uh, this rotation operator normally acts on this guy here, but you can always, you know, impose this transformation to matrices by using a simple index trick. So that this is the, re the result. I impose a transformation onto matrices. So D2 cross D2 invariance, the assumption of invariance leads to this equation, which is important. And I want to consider the consequence of this. And first of all, first of all, assume, suppose that there are D by D unitary matrices called U, which is in dependent of sigma, and M happens to be written in this way, U dagger M U with some constant. If this is the case, if this is the case, then this equality must hold because, well, that's easy to see. If this is true, if you, if you substitute this here, then for each M tilde, U, U dug R and U appears on both sides and they, they cancel out. We have trace, so you get the right-hand side with some constant. So if you assume this, then it's obvious that you have the invariance. But the most essential thing here is that uh, by using a non-trivial theorem proved by Fannes, Nacht, and Gerwerner about the uniqueness of injective MPS, you can show, also show the converse. This is very essential. So by this invariance assumption, you can also, you can go this way too, and then you can conclude that there are D by D matrices U, we don't know what it is, but with this assumption and also injectivity assumption, we are sure that there are matrices U, which form a projective representation of Z2 cross Z2, and this is true. Now, so I have this and this, both containing M tilde, so they are, the, they are equal. So uh, I can just invert this thing and get this constraint for M only. 
So with the assumption of Z2 cross Z2 invariance and injectivity, I get this constraint for uh, M. Now, uh, it's quite easy to get contradiction out of this. So first of all, I write, I simply wrote, use this relation twice. That means I plug this relation here into this, and then you get this thing. So I, I use this twice, so everything is squared. And as for here, I said this is projective representation, but I have U and U dagger together. Even if you had this unwanted sign, unwanted phase factor, they cancel out, and this is simply M. And this is, as I said, minus one, so this is this. Next thing, what I did was that I used this relation, I wrote this relation with alpha equal x here. I consider that I take the same relation with alpha equal y and plug it in here to get this. No, you have x. I take the same relation with alpha equal z and plug it in here to get this. Again, you will see that this is one and this is m and you get this. And from this and this, uh, we get, so theta is some constant which, whose existence is guaranteed if you assume invariance, d 2 cos c 2 invariance and injectivity, but this constant must satisfy these two relations which are, of course, contradicting. It says that theta must be plus minus i, but you know, you can never, you can never obtain that. So here's a contradiction. So, the main, so this statement has been proved, but the, and, the essence actually goes to back to, goes back to Matsui, but the essence of this uh, proof was this single relation here, and in this single identity for M, this, this M defines matrix product state, we have project in spin one half case, spin half of the integer spin case, we have projective representation here, and we have a genuine representation here of Z2 cross Z. In a single identity, projective and genuine representations both appear. And this leads to contradiction as we have seen. Okay, so uh, with this in mind, uh, I want to go to the full theorem. And so we have shown this, and this is what we want to show. We want to, we take certain Hamiltonian with invariance and want to show that there can be no unique gapped ground state. And first of all, it's, it kind of seems that this thing implies this thing. Why? Well, here's a simple physicist argument. Uh, so assume that we have this Hamiltonian, which is Z2 cross Z2 and translation invariant, and assume that the ground state is unique and gapped. Then from Hastings' result, we know that the ground state has aerial, aerial entanglement, and also since the Hamiltonian has invariance and ground state is unique, we see that the ground state is translationally and Z2 cross Z2 invariant. And now here's a folk statement that aerial state can always be approximated by NPS. Oh, then there exists an injective NPS that is translationally and Z2 cross Z2 invariant. This contradicts theorem one prime, and we are done. And this looks plausible, uh, but actually this doesn't work. I mean, if you really sit down and try to make it into a mathematical proof, uh, we have to be very careful about this approximation by MPS. And I talked to experts, uh, the presently known approximation theorems are not that strong. And actually, the proof that Ogata and I found was totally different, and we do make you essential use of something called operate algebraic formulation. That is rather sophisticated, heavy mathematics. So let me talk about that a little bit. Yes? Injectivity is, of course, I defined, but basically uh, the argument is that if, if you have aerial or entanglement state, the sufficiently state with small entanglement is basically mapped to injective state. That is the basic uh, belief. No degeneracy in the uh, transfer, transfer matrix. So we can talk about it. So uh, physically speaking, this is very natural. 
very natural. And so, okay, so where was I? So I want to talk about something called operator algebraic formulation. And that is, for example, famous in uh, approach to quantum uh, field theory. So there is a field called axiomatic quantum field theory, and that makes heavy use of this operator algebraic formulation. And they, for axiomatic quantum field, field theory, there is a very famous quote, which goes, the contribution of axiomatic quantum field theory to physics is, probably some of you know this, uh, is less than any given positive epsilon. So this is a very bad joke, and I think we have video. This should be bleeped out. And uh, so, but of course, I'm not supporting this bad joke. Uh, but so instead, let me talk about our opinions of slightly different aspect. Uh, mathemat opinion of one mathematical physicist on operator algebraic approach to spin system. Uh, so here is a young student in his early 20s. He's young and naive, ambitious, and he learns about this kind of formulation. And he, hey, here's a formulation that allows us to treat infinite systems as they are. Probably we can solve many difficult problems like phase transition, critical phenomena, renormalization by using this fancy mathematics. And he starts reading difficult books with his friends. And after a while, he found that, well, in most cases, physically interesting results like, like, like the existence of phase transition is proved without using C star algebra. It was just proved by using usual Pyrrhus argument for finite system, and then they take infinite body limit and so on. So he was kind of disappointed. Now time has passed, and now he's in like mid or late 20s, and he's now a postdoc. And he is a very self-confident postdoc. And now his opinion is de definite. It's useful for, it, these things are form, useful for formulating various concepts of infinite system, but not for proving concrete result. So if we want to prove interesting result, we can work within finite system and then take infinite for limit if we, it's necessary. So that was his opinion. And I think uh, he produced some interesting result in this direction. But uh, so. But as Peter, Peter will talk about tomorrow, uh, our world is irreversible and typically we all get older. So now he's no longer a young fossil coin. Oh, okay, so this is somewhat, uh, this is somewhat con consistent with the bad joke. And as I said, so time has passed and this person is now an old guy. And, but now his opinion has changed. That's the interesting part of our life. He found that, well, it's useful. And actually, the one, one thing is this work that I'm talking about. And also, Yoshiko has produced a very interesting result about symmetry protected topological phase, which again makes essential use of all these formulations. So I have to go to this uh, operator for algebraic formulation to outline our proof. So, uh, of course, I cannot give you a full lecture. That will be a long, long series of lecture. So just give you an outline, and also my time is running. Uh, so the starting point is something called c star algebra. That is basically the set of all possible operators, uh, local operators. And especially in this case, we consider set of all local operators which lives on the half-infinite chain. And omega denotes the unique ground state of the model that we want to consider. And then there is a standard technique called the GNS construction. Given a C-star algebra and a state, then you can construct a Hilbert space H and a you can find a vector omega from here. And there is a representation of C-star algebra in the set of all, bo all, all bounded operators on H. Yeah. And in this case, this representation is very nice, and this is the ground state expectation value that can be always expressed in this vector, uh, vector state form, our familiar expectation value form. Okay, so this is rather standard. I knew it from my, since I was a student, but now here comes slightly more sophisticated part. So pi is a representation of C-star algebra, so this pi of R, R is a representation of C-star algebra, and this thing itself is a C star algebra, which is embedded in this B of H. Then there is another standard procedure called bicommutant. It's the same as taking closure with respect to the weak topology in this space, which it's just called double prime, but it, ma it makes 
it slightly en enlarges this C star algebra and make it into a new object, new mathematically nice object called von Neumann algebra. And this seemingly innocent double prime is a magic, which is necessary for all these things. And actually, it's a magic to me. This is a difficult mathematics. I actually, whose essence I don't really understand. But anyway, uh, I have this C star algebra and this von Neumann algebra. Okay, so then, it is known that if the state omega, which was used to construct all these, satisfies a pro property called the split property, and actually unique gap ground state satisfies this property to Hastings and Matsui, then this von Neumann algebra is, uh, becomes a, something called a type one factor, another jargon. Type one factor is one of the most innocent, well-behaved version of von Neumann algebra. And then, uh, it is known, this is written in text in von Neumann algebra, uh, type one factor is always isomorphic to the set of all bounded operators on certain Hilbert space H tilde. This is a new Hilbert space. And on this new Hilbert space, uh, we can uh, find an essential object, which is called the Kuntz algebra. By using the translation invariance, translation invariance, we can construct a representation of the Kuntz algebra, the sigma, which lives on this von Neumann algebra, and this guy is indexed by sigma, spin index. And here's uh, defining equations for the Kuntz algebra, but I'm not going into this, but I can say that this object can be regarded as an infinite dimension version of matrices for MPS. And here's a, here's a very rough picture, which is very non-rigorous, and my collaborator, Yoshiko, doesn't like this. It's too heuristic. But this is a very heuristic picture of what this guy does. So here's a spin configuration on half infinite chain, like Hilbert's hotel. And then you ask all the guests to move on to the next room, the room uh, next to him. So everybody moves on the right, and there is one empty room, and this sigma comes in. And I said we are working on infinite system, half infinite chain, and that is, if you see this picture, you see that half infinite is necessary. If you have a long chain and if you do this, then the, the one on the right must get out of this cat or tail. But if you have this infinite, half infinite chain, then this kind of construction works, and that is essential. And for, and of course this is non-rigorous because uh, this C does not act on usual catch space, it acts on H tilde. But anyway, it's a some, it does something like this. And mo most essential thing about this uh, oh, no, no, Kuntz algebra is that it's, it's, the, it's transformation property. So we can show that under Z2 cross D2, this C transforms this way, but uh, in short, this is, this is exactly the same as the transformation we have seen for the MPS. So in this case too, we have a single relation, but in, in this single relation, we have projective representation and genuine representation together. And this leads you to a contradiction, and that is basically our theorem. Okay, so before closing, I want to talk about some extensions of this, including this SCAR thing. Uh, first of all, I only talked about Z2 cross Z2 symmetry, but uh, it has been known since Chenggu Wen that this can be replaced by any on-site symmetry whose representation on a single spin is projective. An example is a time reversal symmetry for half or integer spin case, spin system. In this case, you flip the sign of all spin variables. And, and this kind, uh, the same thing works for this. And recently, Yuji Tachikawa found a beautiful proof for this general case. And also, uh, I only talked about the ground state, unique gap ground state, but actually the essence is that we only uh, need to talk about uh, pure translation invariant states that satisfy the split property. So, in this sense, any translation invariant pure state with area law uh, entanglement is excluded in this type of general theorem. So the most general theorem that we can think about is this. So this is too abstract, but, uh, but the abstract theorem says that in quantum spin chain, 
There can be no translation invariant pure state with area law entanglement and on-site symmetry whose, project, whose representation on a single spin is projected. So a corollary, which uh, is related in some sense to the SCAR, as I understand, a SCAR is an energy eigenstate, which is not necessarily a ground state, which has area law entanglement for some strange reason, and it, is, it, it uh, bothers a system from being thermalized. And so, so by using this thing, one corollary we get is that in a translation invariant spin chain with, spin, with half order integer spin and time reversal of Z2 cross Z2 symmetry, you may have a scar, but scar must, must be degenerate and break some symmetry. And I think in the known example, this is happening. So this is my summary slide, LSM type is proved. Uh, the proof is based on inconsistency. Uh, between the projective and transformation, the projective symmetry and transformation property of the Kuntz algebra. And well, it was surprising to me that such a, such a sophisticated object as von Neumann algebra is useful in this kind of physically natural theorem. And finally, this is an adv advertisement. And um, actually, I'm preparing a book, and it will come out soon from Springer. And if you're interested in this kind of uh, quantum spin chains and all this related business, uh, please take a look at this. So thank you very much for your attention. No questions? Oh, my joke, which one? <laughs> you work, from the outset, you work infinite system. Right? Yes. But then it is understood finite systems converge in some sense right. to this. Right, right, right. But this you also should prove. How do you know that finite systems have to do something with your infinite systems? Oh, if you, if you start immediately with the infinite system. But, but in many cases, but in many cases, we work on finite system and prove some size independent estimate. So for, for, if you want to consider, yeah, phase transition and so on, we, we, we start with some size independent uh, estimate for finite system. And then we also prove things, or people have proved the, uh, many results about the existence of infinite volume limit. So if you con usually we combine this existence of infinite volume limit type statement and system size uniform, uh, sy system size independent estimates for finite system to get something about infinite system. But something you cannot do is like this Hilbert's hotel type thing. And if you want to move all the spins to the right and add one thing, you cannot, it is not sufficient to work with a very long chain. And that, if you want to do that kind of game, you have to first, you have to work in infinite system from to, to, to begin with. And well, I, I still want to do this in a more elementary way. But for, for the moment, I don't know how to do that. And this kind of infinite trick is really useful. Any comments? Any comments? Uh, so, question. So, in the last part of your talk, you mentioned briefly about this no-go theorem for scars, yes. uh, which have area law. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is some numerical evidence in some particular models that these scars can also have slightly faster than area law, but much slower than volume law, uh, like logarithm in L for 1D systems. So you mean it's more entangled than yeah, yeah. area low, but yeah. yeah. But these are numerical uh, yeah. studies. That's very interesting, but probably this, I don't know. So the key is, actually, we, we, I still cannot say that. The key is something called the split property. And that's, that's basically, roughly speaking, on it said that if you have an infinite state on an infinite chain, if you cut it here, and then, Basically, it's the same. It won't be hurt. That is a 
and waving way of stating split property. And what Matsui showed that is that if you have an aerial entanglement, then split property is true. So of course, we, 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 the question about this uh, slightly different entanglement property and the relative variation between your entanglement and this split property is, I think, still open. If that is really seriously true, I would bring this, this issue to mathematicians. Yes, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs>